How's everyone doing? Good. Well, my name's Jack. If we haven't met yet, we are honored that you guys are here. I'm the lead pastor, and um, always an honor. I tell Wendy all the time, I'm just thrilled that people just show up. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for investing in your relationship with Jesus, because that's what you're doing this morning, and taking the time, and, um, and the investment that you make in kingdom, kingdom stuff. So thank you for that. So we, we sent about 30 kids and leaders up to Whiteout. That was the crew before they left. And as far as I can tell, things are going great. You know, I get my information on Facebook just like you do. Um, and then back in the fall, this was, the, I think, the first year we had to separate middle and high schoolers just getting too big up there. So the uh, middle schoolers went last fall. So um, great, great stuff happens up there. Any of you that like ever went to church camp when you were a kid, I mean, it's just, it can be life-changing for some of these kids. And it, I think it just gives them a, a chance to just unplug and just really um, hear truth. Um, so great, great stuff. Well, today I want to continue our series in Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And I've kind of titled my talk Amazing Jesus this morning. A couple of weeks ago when we were in our, um, our selfless uh, series, I mentioned the word goat. Do you guys remember what goat stood for? Yeah, the greatest of all time. The goat. And everybody's asking, who's the goat? Uh, recently, after the Super Bowl, they were, they were calling, you know, Tom Brady the goat again with his six Super Bowl wins. And we always kind of will argue about who's the greatest in different arenas. Uh, some of you remember... Um, Muhammad Ali, the boxer, remember? And I think he called himself the GOAT. I think actually his company was named greatest of all time or something with his 56 wins and 37 knockouts. Um, I couldn't help when I was listening to uh, the eulogies of George H.W. Bush, one of our presidents recently, just um, how much people loved him and, and, and how some people were saying, you know, he was, he was great. He was great at, at what he did. A um, lot of stuff I didn't know, that he was in public service for 40 years. He was a war hero who had been shot down in the ocean and picked up by a submarine, I think. Um, head of the CIA. Um, what else? Oh, signer of the American Dis with Disabilities Act. That was a really big deal. And so it's really interesting when there's certain people that will tell you they're the greatest of all time, right? But when other people say it about you, doesn't it mean more? I mean, isn't that when you really kind of lean in and, and especially who's saying it about somebody else? You know, how credible are they uh, in their witness? There's a new term, fairly new. It's called humble brag. Are you guys familiar with the humble brag? Let me tell you, a, a humble brag is a statement that, that's really a, a boasting or bragging, but it's disguised by, by a complaint or a humble apology. Let me give you some examples from the, from the internet. Here we go. Um, man, this is so unfair. Why did the Lambo dealership not tell me I'd get pulled over at least once a week in this car? Time for a Corolla, LOL. Here's another one. I just did something very selfless. But more importantly, it was genuine, and I know it meant a lot to the person in the long run. Hashtag so worth it. Totally walked down the wrong escalator at the point at the airport from the flashes of the cameras. Go me. Um, oh, here's one. I am featured in people's most beautiful. What can I say? They all make mistakes. But did the shoot with no makeup, and I have to say scary. Setting up your own charity event is no joke. Would have thought it would be easier. This is hard. And finally, here's one from a pastor. I'm truly humbled you follow my tweets. I pray they enrich your life and strengthen your ministry. God bless all 200,000 of you. <laughs> Humble brags, self-promotion. Tom Brady said he doesn't really like being called the goat. Uh, He'd rather be called the underdog because it makes him work harder. George H.W. was never a self-promoter. His mom taught him from a young age. I mean, I, I heard that the speechwriters 
would always try to get him to say things about himself and he wouldn't do it. And if he did, his mom would call and she'd say, George, no one wants to hear about the, the great I am. Stop talking about yourself. And it was just kind of amazing the things that were said about him at his eulogy. So um, today, it's as if Mark in his gospel is saying, look, Jesus is the greatest of all time. And I'm going to call like some witnesses, some, some, some people um, that you may or may not find credible that, that said this about him. And so in the first kind of chapter, we're going to look at these different kind of witnesses that he called to the witness stand. I don't, I don't know about you, but I love courtroom dramas. It's like one of my favorite shows. Um, a Few Good Men is probably one of my favorites, but you've got to watch it on TV after it's been edited because it can be pretty rough. Um, but what a great courtroom drama. So Mark, it's as if he's calling these different people. And just for review, remember last week I, was, I said that the Gospels... Um, they all had a specific audience and, and a specific purpose. They were written to a specific audience and a specific purpose. So Mark's gospel is specifically written to followers of Jesus living in Rome, mostly Gentiles, and his purpose is to show Jesus as the Son of God, the power of Jesus. Um, and so it's just like an action-packed book, and you'll see that in the next few weeks as we go through it. And he constantly shows the kingdom of God and how God's, Jesus has ushered in this kingdom and God's rule and reign. So let's get going. Verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. So Mark starts out by quoting Isaiah uh, and what he said basically about John the Baptist. He says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 5, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt uh, around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So John's kind of a wild man. I mean, he's, this isn't the normal way to dress or the normal, like, diet for people. Um, anybody eat lo locusts ever? I, I haven't either. Um, not that desperate. Verse 7, and this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Mark's case for Jesus being the Son of God, the first witness he seems to call is John the Baptist. Now, what do we know about John the Baptist? You've all heard of John the Baptist, right? Who's, who's heard of John the Baptist? Like 2,000 years ago, and, and we know him. We know his name. But what do we know about him? I mean, he was pretty special um, all on his own. Uh, he was prophesied about by Isaiah and Malachi 700 years before. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. No, he did not start the Baptist church. Some people think he did, but he didn't. But he was amazing. He had many followers. Um, Josephus, a Jewish historian, um, wrote about John the Baptist in his and, and took it Antiquities of the Jews. What I love about Josephus is, I mean, this guy didn't have anything to do with Jesus that I know, but he would write about, you know, people that we see in the Bible. So he has a really unique perspective. It's a great read. Um, we know that John was a miracle baby, that um, his parents were too old to have kids, and an angel appeared to his father and said, look, you're going to have a son, and I want you to name him John. So his name is, is divinely given. Um, his name is from a Hebrew term signifying Jehovah is gracious, which is pretty cool. His parents were um, out of the priestly uh, order of things, and they were devout followers of God. His mother Elizabeth was related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. 
And his mission was to prepare the way for Jesus. And his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that word repent, I mean, for us it doesn't mean a lot, but it, it, it means to just change direction. If, if you're going one direction, go a different direction. Matthew, Luke, and John all include details in their Gospels um, about John the Baptist. Jesus calls him, in John 1.16, a man sent from God. John was committed to the mission. He died for the mission. King Herod, after his uh, stepdaughter had done this dance at a, at a birthday party, he said, I'll give you anything you want. That was amazing. What do you want? And she had a pretty twisted mother. And the mom said, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter for my birthday present. And that's like Netflix stuff, right? <laughs> and that's what happened. I mean, what a way to go. But he was a threat. I mean, he was a barbarian in a good way. In Matthew 11, 11, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so John the Baptist is our first witness about Jesus. Verse 7, he says, After me comes the one more powerful than I. As great as John the Baptist was, he knew he wasn't the greatest of all time. He knew there was another one that was coming. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. And what's really, really special about him, I've been baptizing you with water, but he's bringing a new baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that a little bit next week. We're going to circle back around to some of these. In John's gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And for John to testify that about Jesus, the one who takes away sin from the world, there's only one person who can take away sin, and it's God. And so again, there's his testimony that this is truly the Son of God. Let's look at our second witness. In verse 9, it says, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Who's our second witness? Kind of simple. It's God. Right? God. Of all people you could call to the witness stand, here's God. Here's heaven being torn open. And God saying, this is my son, whom I love, and in whom I'm well pleased. And what I love about this is Jesus hasn't started his ministry. He hasn't done much. Um, but God is pleased with him. And it's the same way for you. I mean, God is pleased with you. Just because you're his creation. Like this, this little baby, I mean, God is just thrilled when you're in his presence because he created you. But before you do anything, he's just pleased with you. And he loves to just hang out with you just because you're his kid. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. He made the first move. Before we did anything, before we could respond. Well, let's go on. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. And then uh, verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Remember in our Kingdom Tension series, if you want to know about kingdom stuff, go back and watch that. It's on the website. But Jesus came to usher in a new kingdom. And everywhere he went, it was about the kingdom. And here's that statement, the kingdom is near. 
God's kingdom is near. God's kingdom is here. Wherever Jesus went, I heard somebody say it was like, you know, it's kind of like he sat down at dinner and, 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 and tucked the tablecloth into his pants and then got up and everywhere he walked, the tablecloth just followed him around. It's like heaven just went everywhere he went. And stuff happened everywhere he went. He ushered in this, this kingdom where God has rule and reign. Many of you from a liturgical background, you prayed a prayer. What was it? Your whole life, you recited a prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a kingdom prayer that you prayed. So John's in prison, and it's, it's like John is kind of passing on the baton now to Jesus. And less John, more Jesus, which is really what should happen in all of our lives, right? Less Jack, more Jesus. I need to decrease so Jesus can increase. And that message, the kingdom is near. Okay, let's continue because it's going to get good here. Even better. Verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brothers, his brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. And Jesus said in verse 17, come follow me. Come follow me, you guys. What do they do? Jesus said, I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Verse 19, when he had gone a little bit farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Again, they're fishermen. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Our third witness are the disciples. What would compel these guys to leave everything? I mean, to leave the family business, their poor dad's just sitting in there with the hired guys and his sons are gone. What would compel them to do that, to drop everything and just follow Jesus? Well, I think there's probably more to the story. Remember I told you last week the Gospels weren't all inclusive. They weren't intended to be biographies. But I have to think that God was already at work Something was happening. Maybe their, the father had had a dream. Maybe these guys had had a dream. Something had happened. But they believed in Jesus enough. They believed in his mission enough. They believed in what he was saying enough to just to drop everything. And to me, that's a, that's a pretty big witness to call to the stand. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now, it wasn't uncommon for the leader of the synagogue to have guest speakers in. Sometimes we have guest speakers in here. And so Jesus was the guest speaker. That's a pretty good guest speaker, right? And these guys, you know, probably hadn't heard him before. And so in verse 22, it says, The people were amazed at his teaching. Not so much with what he was saying, but with the authority that he had as he taught. They were amazed uh, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law, kind of what they were used to. And just then, verse 23, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit, some versions say a demon, cries out, this demon cries out in the middle of church. I mean, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? If you think about it, there's a lot of creepy stuff out there in our world, isn't there? There's a lot of, there's stuff you see and read and you just, you go, you just, it's a head scratcher. You're like, how, how, did, how did that happen? And sometimes you have these dark thoughts of your own or a dream or something like that and you're like, wow, wow where did that come from? What is that all about? There, there's a battle going on. There's a kingdom of darkness, and there's God's kingdom. And right now we live in a time where they're clashing. And you're right in the middle of it. And Satan didn't create these demons. These, these were fallen angels who rebelled against God. God created them. So, I mean, God is way bigger than them. Um, but you're in the middle of it, whether you like it or not. 
John 10, 10 says that we have a, an adversary and he has a strategy. It's a three-part strategy. It's really simple. It's to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his strategy. Steal, kill, and destroy. And it's a strategy for you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy your marriage, your relationships, your kids, your identity. I mean, he comes after our identity like crazy. God says this about you, but he whispers these other things about you. There's a battle going on for your potential, for your future, for your friendships, your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, your calling, your gifting. All of that, there's a battle over it. Kill, steal, and destroy. Your reputation. Your wisdom. I mean, doesn't it seem like there's not a lot of common sense out there right now? You, you see, hear stuff and you see stuff and you're just like, where's the just common sense? Like what happened to the common sense? There's a battle going on over you. Death versus life. And Jesus said, I have come to bring what? Life. I have come to bring life. And not just a little bit of life, but like abundant life. He says that right after we hear about the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Satan would love for us to be complacent and just like, you know what, there's nothing really going on. That's just a bunch of hooey. Nothing going on. You know, let's put our heads in the sand. But we're in a battle. There's a clash of two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and God's kingdom. And you are right in the middle of it. You can't go to Switzerland on this one. There's no Switzerland. And so verse 24, the demon says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's the demon. And that's our next witness. Demon knew. The demons know who he is. They used to be angels. And he walks into the room, and they recognize his authority, and they're scared. Are you, gonna, are you here to destroy us? What do you want with us? Because we know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know Christians, people who have been following Jesus a long time, they, they have trouble making that statement. These are the demons making the statement. You're the Holy One of God. We know who you are. What a moment that must have been. Can you imagine later after church going to lunch? What happened at your church today? Place was probably packed next time they met. How does Jesus respond to this demon? Verse 25, be quiet. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. A clash of kingdoms. I love Jesus' response. It's not like the movies, is it? Movies, there's hours of working it and talking to the demon and all that. Jesus doesn't mess around with them. He tells them to shut up. Get out. Now, sometimes we mess around with stuff. We mess around with stuff we shouldn't be messing around with. It needs to be like, shut up, get out. That's authority. That's real authority. The demon left him. Didn't mess with him. I love that Jesus didn't only want to silence the demon, but he wanted to free the man. He wanted to free the man. Can you imagine how big a deal this would have been to his friends and his family? They probably spent a lot of therapy on this guy, right? Probably had to have someone watching him all the time. It's a big deal. And Jesus frees him because he said, I came to bring you life. And that's what he gives back to this man. Wow, what a church service. What a church service. And verse 27, the people were all what? Amazed. Of course they were. The people were so amazed. 
And they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? Like they'd never seen anything like this before. They'd been going to church their whole lives. They'd never seen anyone. They'd never heard anyone like this before. I mean, I almost called them as a witness too. They kind of are. A new teaching with authority. And he even gives orders to impure spirits. And they obey him. Wow. Wow. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. I bet it did. I bet it did. So as I kind of wrap things up, here's a few little takeaways and we'll be done. Thank you for your patience and for listening. Because Jesus is the Son of God, and that's what Mark is, is, is trying to point out, for those of us who follow him, he should be Lord. He should carry that authority in our lives. He should be Lord. That means in the relationship, he should get to dictate the terms. But he doesn't always, does he? We give him pieces and parts, and we let him be in charge, but not all of it. He should be Lord. After college, I had a a brief stint working at IBM in Rochester, Minnesota. It was a giant plant, huge. I think it was a mile from one side to the other. And every now and uh, and again in our department, um, like a really important person would come through. Like, like you'd see his picture on the wall somewhere in the plant. And everyone would kind of stand up a little taller and kind of get quiet. And This guy had authority. I mean, he had the authority. He could promote any of us or he could send any of us packing with just probably an email, you know. Real authority. Does Jesus have real authority in our lives? Mark shows us this authority of Jesus. The kind of authority that looks at a bunch of businessmen and says, you know what, leave all that. Follow me. Just follow me. Well, what are we doing, Jesus? Just follow me. I'll teach you along the way. Do you have a business plan? Just follow me. Trust me. Follow me. And that's what they did. When he was baptized, the kind of authority where heaven opens up and God speaks. It didn't happen at my baptism. I don't know about you. And the Holy Spirit shows up. The the Trinity, they're together. The kind of authority that that when he teaches the crowds, they go, what was that? We have never seen that before. The kind of authority where he walks in the room and the demons get nervous. And they take notice. And then they obey him whatever he tells them to do. That's real authority. So for us, what I see here is, first of all, we need to follow his calling. Each of you has a call on your life. Something that you were created to do. Maybe someone you were supposed to, you're supposed to, I don't know, interact with. Somebody God's put in your way. I don't know, only you know. You've got to figure that out. And when you do, you've got to follow. No questions asked. You've got to follow. The second thing I think we need to do that we've lost is we need to be amazed. We need to be amazed. I remember when I was younger and I was just amazed thinking about God, how big he was, looking at the stars and creation, and thinking about like if our planet was just a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all like burn up and it was just a little farther away from the sun we would all freeze to death and oxygen I mean I love oxygen <laughs> we get to breathe and you look at a newborn baby and you're amazed and you're like those little fingers those little toes how does it all work be amazed again because you know what When we think of someone who's truly amazing, we want to be around them. We want to get their autograph. We hope they brush by us in the room, you know, wave at us in the parade. We go to their concerts or we go to listen to what they have to say and we study them and we read about them and we we, we Facebook stalk them and all that stuff, right? Because we're amazed. 
by who they are. And when we recognize Jesus' authority, then we need to give him permission. Because he's not going to be pushy. He still believes in free will. He's not going to be pushy. You have to give him permission. There's a vineyard pastor in, um, at Blue Route Vineyard, Mark Tyndall, out in Philadelphia. I heard him say this once. He says, you know, as a pastor, I have this authority. I, can, I, I, get, to, I get to pronounce people husband and wife. That's a pretty cool thing, right? That's a pretty cool authority. I, I don't, I've lost track of how many times I've had the honor of doing that. But what Mark says, he says, you can't, I can't just go down to like the mall and start randomly pronouncing people. Hey, you and you, I pronounce you. You are now husband and wife. I don't have the authority. I haven't been given the permission to do that. You have to give Jesus permission in your life. He's not like a telemarketer. They don't have permission to call me. That's why they're so annoying, right? Just had to throw that in there. By the way, if I don't recognize your number, I won't answer. So don't take it personally. But I'll Google it. I'll Google it pretty quick and see who you are. The other thing is listen. We see that the the people listen to him. They listen to him. We need to listen to him. If we'll listen, he'll say, you know what? This is the way to do life. And this is the way not to do life. This is the way to do relationships. And this is the way not to do relationships. These are the things that, these are the things that, that bother me. And these are the things that please me. But we have to listen. And he'll teach us. And he'll help us renew our mind. And he'll show us the way. And lastly, we need to obey. When we recognize his authority, when we give him permission, we have to obey. We don't like doing that very much, do we? We need to obey. We need to trust him. No questions asked. Travis, why don't you come up? So if you're taking notes today, we recognize his authority, we follow his call, We're amazed, we're amazed, we listen, and we obey. I know I threw a lot at you this morning, a lot to think about, kind of like a a really nice buffet, right? That's not all completely match up, but there's a lot of little little pieces to, to chew on. Let's go ahead and stand.